Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like over the next eight minutes or so to give you a little bit of a background into the etiopathogenesis of hyperpigmentation. The human family has diverse natural and normal pigmentation levels, as you can see in this image here, where you can see the highest levels of skin and hair and eye pigmentation are approximately around the equator. And as humans migrated north, particularly into northwestern Europe, they developed a very broad palette of colors, as you can see in Western Europe. So when we talk about dispigmentation or abnormalities of pigmentation, these are more commonly found in individuals with skin of color, particularly in the Fitzpatrick scale of phototype three to six. Obviously, for certain individuals, both hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation can exact a significant psychosocial burden and affect their quality of life. The way we measure skin pigmentation now has changed a little bit over the last few years. Um, typically now, the individual topology angle is the value that we assign individuals of particular skin color and skin phototype. As you can see in this uh, diagram here, going from very light to light, and this reflects um, the, basically the, the L and the B of the original LAB color scheme to remove redness from the assessment. But you'll note in this image here, where, where we look at four different Indian cities, that the range of pigmentation, even within a single country, can be very significant in its variation. Going back to the cell biology of pigmentation, here we see a scheme of a melanocyte, which is a bit like an upside down uh, spider with the cell body down here, the nucleus here, and the legs of the spider being dendrites, which ramify between keratinocytes of the epidermis. The process of pigmentation is a multi-step process, starting off with an all-important biochemical reaction involving a rate-limiting enzyme tyrosinase. And the activity of this enzyme is critical for the ability to make the, the pigment melanin. And between people of different ethnic backgrounds or racial backgrounds, the pH optimum for this enzyme tyrosinase can vary. After the melanin has been produced, it is then brought through the dendrites and into even smaller connections called philopodia, whereby the melanin is transferred into the keratinocyte. And this is a highly unusual um, event in mammalian biology, whereby the cell that makes the organelle gives it away to a different cell type. What happens to the melanin thereafter is a bit of a mystery, and I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. Some people believe that melanin somehow degrades, although no chemistry in the skin has been found to degrade melanin. So this is the biochemical pathway underlying pigmentation. Uh, the first part of this has, is the so-called raper mason pathway. And then uh, Giuseppe Prota had an extension to this pathway uh, some years ago that allows us to understand the difference between the brown-black melanins called eumelanins and the red-yellow melanins called pheomelanins. And you can see in this uh, uh, photograph here, the range of brown, black to reddish melanins we see in the human family. I want to now just describe a little bit of, new, of a new paradigm for human skin pigmentation that we have been looking at in the lab that explains a little bit the age old observation of the melanin distribution in human skin epidermis. All textbooks show the concentration of melanin in the basal layer of the epidermis, despite that this is a continuously stratifying epidermis where one would expect melanin produced in the basal layer to be uh, brought through the entirety of the epidermis and not concentrate almost 80% in the basal layer. So we have now looked at the underlying cell biology of this phenomenon and have proposed a new model called the asymmetric mode of distribution. And that is basically described by the fact that when you have a keratinocyte undergoing cell division, one of the daughters stays on the basal layer and the other daughter cell moves up into an upper layer. But remarkably, 80% or approximately 80% of the melanin is inherited only by the daughter cell that stays attached to the basement membrane. And as a result, we get this very sharp cliff edge effect in terms of the melanin from the basal layer to the superbasal layer. However, human skin is smarter than that, 
in that during periods of stress, UV stress, mechanical stress, it is able to undergo a symmetrical distribution of melanin so that both daughter cells inherit the same amount of melanin approximately. And we can see melanin now moving through many more layers of the epidermis. So as you move between the normal steady state and the hyper state uh, under stress, we can see how melanin may change and the appearance of melanin may change in terms of the surface of the skin effect. And this is all down to the fact that melanocytes and keratinocytes engage in this remarkable crosstalk, the so-called epidermal melanin unit. And the most important elements of this crosstalk appear between receptor ligand interactions involving alpha MSH and the melanocortin-1 receptor. So alpha MSH typically from the keratinocyte and the, the melanocortin-1 receptor in the melanocyte. And other signaling pairs like stem cell factor and C-kit, and here we also have basic fibrous growth factor, are also important for driving the process of making melanin in this particular melanocyte, as you see here. The dermis cell, the fibroblast, is also thought to be important in this communication. So common hyperpigmentary conditions, before I hand over to my colleague, Professor Enzo Baradesca, include solar limb tigo and our AIDS, our sunspots. And here we can see an increase under the influence of ultraviolet radiation in keratinocyte number. And you see this remarkable elongation of the so-called weak ridge. We also see solar elastosis in the dermis, and we can see melanin drop into the dermis as well. Another type of hyper common hyperpigmentation is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, where we get again an increase in um, melanocyte activity, not typically melanocyte number, but more melanin produced and transferred to the keratinocytes. If this melanin stays within the epidermis, we tend to have a brownish or tannish color in terms of the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And this will usually fade in time. If the melanin, <clears throat> excuse me, moves into the dermis, it takes on a more bluish or gray appearance, as you can see here. And this melanin is much harder to shift and may take years to, to be lost. Another type of hyperpigmentation is melasma. It exists in several different forms an epidermal form where it's mostly restricted, the melanin is mostly restricted to the epidermis. This is the most common type. The dermal form where we have now melanin move into the dermis, and then we have a mixed form. And the shade or tone of the pigmentation will vary depending on whether you're epidermis specific, dermal type or mixed type. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy now to hand over to my colleague, Professor Baradeska, thank you.